everyone from St. John's, Newfoundland and Labrador. My name is Janet Heron, and I am an alumni engagement officer at Memorial, and I am your host for today's event. I'm here with Memorial alumnus, daughter, Dr. Jonathan Anderson, BA, B Engineering 06 and Masters of Engineering 08, a faculty member in the Faculty of Engineering and Applied Science, joining us today from the beautiful new Core Science and Engineering facility, who will be talking to us about cybersecurity. I know those of you who are attending can't see who else is in the room for the event, but we have a full house, over 380 registrants. And as of 101, uh, we have 125 people at the event and more are joining every second. So we are delighted about that. We will begin today's event with a land acknowledgement. We acknowledge that the lands on which Memorial University's campuses are situated are in the traditional territories of diverse Indigenous groups, and we acknowledge with respect the histories and cultures of the Beothic, Mi'kmaq, Innu, and Inuit of this province. We encourage everyone to reflect on these lands from where you are located and the Indigenous peoples for whom these lands are traditional territory. At the Office of Alumni Engagement, we are focused on offering many ways for you to connect with Memorial from anywhere in the world. We are working diligently to create opportunities to celebrate, socialize, mentor, learn, and advance both your career and improve your life. Mon Alum 101 was born out of the need to reach out to alumni during the first few months of the pandemic. It has since evolved to become a cornerstone of our alumni engagement activities, offering the latest information on key topics from Memorial University's own experts. Embarking on new and exciting ways to build relationships within our Memorial family of over 100,000 members is vital to our evolution as an institution. Alumni are the drivers of economic, social, and cultural development across the province and beyond. So please consider getting involved with our programming. You can be a mentor with 10,000 coffees, discover opportunities to meet up with expats through Global NL, and our online book club Coastlines features a stellar selection of Newfoundland and Labrador authors. You can find more details on our website, www.mon.ca slash alumni. Thank you so much for joining us today for our discussion about cybersecurity. Just a few housekeeping issues. We will follow Dr. Anderson's presentation with a q and I will be monitoring the Q&A and the function, the Q&A function you will find at the bottom right of your screen. Please try to keep your questions short and I encourage you to post questions as soon as possible. Please don't leave them to the last minute as we have a very full program and we'll only have limited time to take questions. Um, attendees are not able to unmute your microphone or turn on video and you won't be able to see other people's messages in the chat. We are streaming live, but this session is being recorded and you will receive a link to the event in a follow up email. So it is my great pleasure to officially introduce our special guest today. Dr. Jonathan Anderson works in computer security and privacy with interests in operating systems, protocols, programming languages, and the hardware software interface. Originally from St. John's, he completed his Bachelor of Engineering in 2006 and his Master's of Engineering in 2008 with, from, from Memorial, and he completed his PhD at the University of Cambridge in 2012 as a Rothermere Fellow. After two additional years at Cambridge as a postdoctoral research associate, Dr. Anderson returned home to Newfoundland in 2014 to take up his current post as an associate professor in the Faculty of Engineering and Applied Sciences. I will now pass the presenter controls over to Dr. Anderson and um, I will mute my own audio and turn off my video so we can concentrate on his presentation. Well, thanks very much, Janet. And thank you to everyone who's joined us today. It's fantastic to, uh, to be able to give this presentation and hopefully this will be something that's of interest and you'll, uh, you'll learn a couple of things here and there. Um, hopefully everyone's able to see my presentation now and uh, let's see, maybe I'll just pop open that chat so Janet can let me know if there are any issues coming along. 
Okay, um, so in the next few minutes, let's talk a little bit about cybersecurity. Cybersecurity 101, they asked me to talk about. Um, and actually, it's kind of funny because cybersecurity is not a term I'm a huge fan of because it can mean a lot of different things to a lot of people. I'm mostly going to use the phrase computer security in this presentation, but know that for some people, those things are synonymous and other people, those things are very much not synonymous. But it is an exciting word that everybody um, is kind of interested in. So here we go. So today we're going to talk about three questions. We're going to talk about the why, the what, and the how. So we're going to talk about why is security so important? Why do we really care about computer security, cybersecurity? And the answer has a lot to do with how dependent we are on technology. We're going to talk a little bit about the what. What is computer security? Why is it important? How is it different from other forms of risk management? And then we're going to talk just a little bit at the end about how. How is it that we can use computers with confidence? And what is it that you can and in some cases can't do to protect your own information and your own privacy and security online. So to start with, let's talk about the why. Why in the world should we even care about this? There are so many subjects in this world that are really exciting and engaging and interesting to the people who study them, but yeah, other people in the world don't necessarily need to know too much about them. But I'm gonna contend that this is a slightly different kind of subject, that this is a subject that everybody needs to know at least a little bit about, and at the very least, everyone needs to care about. Why? And the answer, well, part of the answer, has to do with our dependence on technology. And this is not necessarily a bad thing, but it's a thing we need to be aware of. Computing systems give us opportunities to do really, really exciting, efficient, innovative, new things. Um, but that can lead us into a place where we end up being very dependent on those systems. So what are some of those key opportunities that computers provide us and how do we get in this fix in the first place? So um, one opportunity that computers give us is kind of to provide like an extension of ourselves through algorithmic thinking and through writing software and developing computer systems. We get to kind of project algorithmic extensions of ourselves out into the world. What in the world does that mean? That sounds all very philosophical. What does that mean practically, Dr. Anderson? Well, imagine, and in this picture we have an example of before digitalization, before many of the services that we use today went online, almost all decisions that had to be made in this world were made by people. People sitting in rooms, people sitting at desks, etc. Um, and if you wanted something, if you wanted something from a bank before you could go online and do it through a self-serve calculator online, um, you would probably communicate with a person. You might phone them up, you might write them a letter, how quaint. Um, you might walk into their office and you might ask them a question. But a key thing is that a person would make a decision and that person would make that decision based on well i mean they might make it based on their training based on their experience based on policies they've been given they would also make decisions sometimes based on their own biases and prejudices and that's a real thing to consider too um sometimes they would make a decision based on all of the above plus some kind of innate sense of what feels like the right thing well i know the policy says this but that just i don't know that doesn't seem right so let me see what i can do for you that kind of thing um, and so it could be that there would have been kind of a, a coterie of higher ups writing the policies down for a rookery of clerks to implement, to follow, to make those decisions. But still, a human being was involved in making each decision at every step of the way, which meant if you wanted to serve twice as many customers in your bank, you would need more clerks. Maybe not quite twice as many, but you'd need a lot more. If you wanted to scale up your business to serve a hundred times, a thousand times, 10,000 times as many customers, well, that would come with very, very substantial costs and it would come with a lot of time costs as well. So this kind of moves us into the world of algorithmic processing. One of the opportunities that comp putting computing systems into the key systems that affect our daily lives is it gives us an opportunity to make decisions upfront about things like policies and encode them in a sense um, using programming as a way of describing rules to a computing system. So we can say, 
<clears throat> and of course, and please note this disclaimer, I'm not a financial advisor. This is not financial advice, but hopefully this is an idea that, uh, that everyone can understand that in a financial system, there are rules around who's eligible to do what and what are the maximum values of things. If those rules can be encoded in a form that are not passed as policies to people, but instead are passed as code to computers, then we can in enforce those policies very quickly and inexpensively. And so we write the rules down, we use the computers to apply the rules almost instantaneous and with very little cost. And from an interesting kind of societal perspective, without exception. So the computer doesn't do the thing of saying, well, I know that's the policy, but let me see if I can bend the rules for you. It, it enforces these policies generally without exceptions. Increasingly, and people often want to know, well, how does artificial intelligence and machine learning affect this? Well, increasingly, we don't even write down the rules in advance. We just point a computer system at a whole bunch of decisions that have been made before, say, you try to discern whatever patterns are in this information, and then go and replicate those patterns, go and make more decisions that look like these decisions. Um, but with a computing system like this, if we can have rules that a computer can enforce cheaply, we can scale up massively. And so suddenly a business doesn't need to hire 10,000 times as many people in order to serve 10,000 times as many customers. But a business can start in a garage and scale up to the point where billions of people are using its services. The more people are required to get to that level, but we don't have to scale up employees the same way that we used to have to scale up customers. So this is a real opportunity for computing systems and a real opportunity for innovation. Um, so we can build things that provide scalable control and also we can build systems and this is where it comes a little closer to an engineer's heart. Um, we can build systems that rely on instantaneous control. So what do I mean by that? Well, for example, let's imagine that we have a an industrial control system. So now, instead of having to rely on a human operator to notice that in this little example that uh, some vessel's pressure is outside of the normal operating bounds and maybe go over to a place and turn a valve and turn it down. Now, if we know that we're able to intervene more quickly, that might change the nature of the system that we build. We might make it more complex. We might be able to shave some of the margins off for example, and then there's a question of, well, how much should we do it? Um, but you can see how the increased ability to project our decision making out into the future can lead to much, much more complex systems and systems with much tighter margins. So we can have more sophisticated rules than we've ever been able to enforce before, and we can make much more complex systems than we've been able to make before. A second huge kind of game changing opportunity that computing systems bring us that make us depend or that make us want to become or to do things that make us dependent on them is the possibility of perfection. And what do I, what do I mean by that? I don't mean that computing systems are perfect. I'm about to tell you a lot about how they're really, really not. Um, but when we moved from an analog world to a digital world, something important did change and it gave us an idea that something was possible that wasn't possible before. So uh, there's a picture here of some cassette tapes and maybe some people here have fond memories of recording radio signals onto a cassette tape and then maybe taking songs from different cassettes and then making a mixtape out of those. Well, every step in that process, you lose something because every signal is accompanied by noise and everything we might do to a signal will cause more noise to accumulate, et cetera. So we degrade things as we use them. And this is kind of like taking a photocopy of a photocopy of a photocopy of a photocopy. Whereas the digital world afforded us an opportunity for something new, the possibility of creating perfect copies of an original and transmitting information without losing anything. Now, it's a little more complicated than that. There's a lot of analog stuff that happens in order to keep this digital abstraction up. However, it is possible to, and we got used to the idea, that you can transmit information, store it, copy it, move it around, do things with it, and not lose anything. So it gave us sort of this notion of the possibility of perfection, and even kind of gave us an expectation in some senses 
of perfection. We, I think, are a little bit less understanding of a computer that isn't doing what it's supposed to do than we traditionally were of an analog system where we knew maybe we needed to give it a kick or something like that. So it gave us the possibility of perfection and maybe set up a little bit of a false expectation. So because these and lots of other really exciting opportunities that computing systems give us, we have digitalized the world. We're automating everything. I mean, obviously things like office work. So I've already talked about a bank. I mean, you can imagine um, if you want to do something with a bank these days, you are probably going to not go into the branch, but you're probably going to go to their website and use their online calculator or their online banking or something. But even if you decide, no, I'm not going to use the online system. I'm going to go into the branch. You might sit down in front of a loans officer. And what's the first thing they do? They open up an internal software tool that has the same logic as you could have used on the website. So obviously we're automating a lot of the office world, um, but it's not just that stuff. It's also industrial control systems, as I mentioned, control systems and increasingly their safety systems are digital, automated, and increasingly malicious software is starting to specifically attack industrial control systems and most frighteningly not just the systems that control a plant but the safety systems that are designed to catch a malfunctioning plant if the primary control software doesn't work that's now something that is starting to happen and that's that's kind of frightening transportation systems are obviously being automated so um once upon a time you know, i i'm not that old but i can remember when it was big news that um that aircraft manufacturers were starting to make fly-by-wire systems and this kind of thing and this is very very passe now of course they're all fly-by-wire of course cars are all drive-by-wire but it's more than that we're talking about how do we build more autonomy into cars how do we build autonomy into seagoing vessels? So maritime autonomous surface ships, mass, is a very, very real thing. And lots of countries around the world are trying to figure out how to do this well, how to do this safely. And, and what are the computer security implications? And in that case, I think everyone could agree that the word cybersecurity is appropriate. What are the cybersecurity implications of vessels that drive themselves, some of which have already been built and are starting to be sailed in national waters around the world. We even have increasing levels of automation in conflict. I think it's a Turkish company now that will sell you a drone which is armed and which can be told to recognize a target via certain criteria and say, go find something that looks like this. This is the vehicle that we're looking for. And a human being is no longer in the loop at that last step of should deadly force be employed. And that is the world we're starting to live in. So we're automating the world and who knows what we're going to automate next. Now, um, well, perhaps not the conflict thing, uh, but for some of these other exercises or some of these other examples, we are availing of opportunities to be to build really exciting things. And you know, I do this all of the time. I know I'm a computer security person, and yet I still write software sometimes because I think oh, this process would be better, or it would be better for the students if I could only, or we could improve something if we added this new system that does something a little more complex than what we did before, a little bit faster, a little more responsive, but also a little more complicated. So we take these opportunities to build more innovative and productive and efficient systems. Um, and now we have built lots and lots of things that we depend on in our daily lives that are complex enough that they can only be controlled via computer. So a person is no longer capable of controlling the system because it requires intervention too frequently or too quickly or the cognitive burden would be too great and so we're building more and more systems that people can't directly control we are now very dependent on some technologies that we weren't dependent on before this isn't necessarily a bad thing we are dependent on all kinds of technologies in this world that we don't mind being dependent on we don't mind being dependent on electricity on transportation systems. We don't mind being dependent on sewer systems. I mean, electricity, transportation, sewers, there are three things that you wouldn't want to go out for more than a day. But as long as we can understand the reliability properties of these things, then it's not necessarily a bad thing that we are so dependent on it. But it is important that whenever we depend on something, that we think carefully about its failure modes, 
and we think about what our backup plans might look like. Um, I quite like a quote that one journalist wrote in the fallout from the uh, the Newfoundland health cyber attack, um, who said that our entire civilization increasingly seems like a system very consciously, even enthusiastically designed around the assumption that our online communication tools will never stop working. And of course, that is a fallacious assumption. We should not assume that things will always continue working, but we should think carefully about what the failure modes of things are and what the, our backup plan ought to be. So we need to think about the risks that come with new technologies. Oh, sorry, I <clears throat> didn't click through there. Um, and by the way, I'm not sure if I'd be able to see it if you typed it into the chat or to the Q&A, but does anybody recognize where this little data center in the picture is from? There's a whole bunch of computers connected by unbelievable amounts of network cabling. Look at those huge bundles, et cetera. Is this data center located at Google? Is it located at Microsoft, Facebook? No, this is um, in the bottom of a Boeing 777. This is the level of automation that is now required to operate an aircraft such as the Boeing 777. And again, as long as we think carefully about its robustness and failure modes, it's not necessarily a bad thing, but we do have to think carefully about risk. So in this life, there is no free lunch. Um, maybe I shouldn't say that at lunchtime because perhaps some of you are sitting there and you're a little hungry. Um, but risks don't go away when we change technologies, they change. So introducing automation into systems can reduce some kinds of risks, but it increases other kinds of risks and it introduces new risks that weren't before, that weren't there before. And we're very used to thinking about risks that we're familiar with. Sometimes people don't always reason very well about risk, but we're used to thinking about risks that have existed already. Um, and we can kind of recognize when a risk that we're familiar with is riskier than it used to be, but brand new risks that we're not familiar with, those are, those are very tricky for us. Um, so automating things, digitalizing things means that, for example, there's less risk of a clerk losing my records behind a filing cabinet or accidentally dropping them or uh, some of a backup list paper copy of something being destroyed in a fire or something like that. But there's more risk of all of us losing all of our records at the same time, or at least losing access to them. So when we automate, we often centralize, and when we centralize, there can be less scope for individual errors, at least by some individuals. Uh, we also suddenly start privileging people who are sysadmins and that kind of thing. Um, but there can be greater systemic risk. And if we're going to accept the benefits of the one, we need to think carefully about the costs of the other. But that's okay. We know how to manage risk, right? We, ha we have a long history of risk management. Um, well, let's think a little bit about what computer security is really about and what makes it different from other fields in which risk management and risk mitigation is important. So in computer security, we are thinking about risk, but we are not just thinking about it in traditional like reliability engineering terms because we are thinking about people and not just things. There's a picture here of a computer that looks all very hackery and oh, maybe this is what computer security is about. But no, computer security is not just about things. It's, it's actually in, in ways that might be surprising and counterintuitive about people. So when we think about the digital risks that we have to mitigate through security techniques, be they operating system interventions or cryptographic techniques or all the various things that my students and I love to dig into in, in great amounts of detail, which you'll be relieved. I'm not going to um, talk about elliptic curve digital signature algorithms in a 30 minute lunchtime talk. Um, but as we dig into those details, we sometimes have to be very careful not to over promise things because in the world of security, there are no guarantees. Sometimes people like cryptographers have been known to make very, very strong claims, and there's truth to some of those claims. Cryptographers can produce mathematical primitives that if you tried to brute force a 120-bit key or certain kinds of encryption algorithms, um, even if you had really, really powerful computers working 24-7, the sun 
would go dark before you are very likely to have a before you have a reasonable expectation of being able to break that key. So there are some very strong claims to be made out there. But the thing is that those individual tools like pieces of cryptography and things are not the whole story. It's not about computer security is not about um, cryptography. It's not about operating systems. It's not about technology, uh, any individual piece of technology. It's about whole systems that include hardware, software, networks, and people, all of which have flaws. So real systems, we cannot make guarantees about security. What we can do is talk about risk, but it's more than just our traditional approach to reliability engineering. So reliability engineering is a well-established discipline that can be used to assess the risk of various kinds of natural events occurring um, here is a picture that visualizes different risks of different kinds of impacts that would cause different types of damage to the international space station um, and we can compute these kinds of risks because there are natural forces at play that govern the orbital motion of other things up in space and all of that kind of thing um, we can calculate probabilities of failure and say well if this is the probability of something failing every time you use it then you would expect to be able to use it so many times before it fails and design systems accordingly um, mostly because reliability engineering is interested in natural adversaries we're interested in floods or rust or things that are orbiting the Earth in orbits that we can predict and understand. What makes security different is adversarial thinking. And so this is where things start to get a little bit cynical. If you're going to think about security, unfortunately, you can't wear rose colored glasses. You have to be a little bit cynical because we are interested not in a flood that will come on average once every hundred years so we better design our foundation accordingly no we are interested in an adversary who will wait until the correct moment wait until we're not looking to try to sneak into the system that kind of thing so adversaries are directed they they want something they have a particular objective and understanding what that objective is makes a huge difference to what we do about the potential of an attack um, Adversaries are strategic, they make choices, they make plans, they don't just act with, um, they, their actions are not something we can describe with statistics and probabilities, they are making strategic choices, and they are adaptive. When we improve this type of defense, they don't just keep banging their head against our defense, they go somewhere else and they look for a weaker way into the same system. So the fact that adversar adversaries are intelligent, they are directed, strategic, adaptive, that changes the way that we think about risk and danger. So there are different qualities that adversaries have. And if you are a business owner, or if you have an organization of some kind and you're trying to protect information, even if you're an individual who's just trying to think about what's the information that I need to protect, this is some of the thinking that needs to go into what kind of adversaries do I reasonably need to be concerned about? Because adversaries vary. In their objectives, like I said, there are many, many adversaries for whom all you need to do to defend against the adversary is just be less vulnerable than the next person. So spam emails and things fall into this category. Um, if, uh, if 100 million spam emails get sent, maybe there are a thousand people who will actually see it. It got through the spam filter and they'll click the link. And then those people will be targeted with more uh, more invasive kind of methods, but all you have to do is not be one of the thousand who clicked the link. So whereas there are other attackers who are interested in you specifically for whatever reason, if you're a public figure or if you hold a, an important position at an organization that they're interested in, well, then their objective might be quite different and just being less vulnerable than the next person might not help you very much. Uh, adversaries also vary in their capabilities. Some will just try the easiest thing that can be tried, and some will spend months or even years developing new capabilities to use, and we deal with those differently. They have different ways they will try to attack organizations. They have different levels of insider access, so um, having an insider inside an organization is extremely helpful for someone who's meant to attack somebody. And if you have a ransomware gang, or if you have a hacktivist network, 
their characteristics will be very, very different because there's probably not an insider who's helping the ransomware gang that is making your organization not be able to fulfill its mission. Um, but if you're somebody who needs to be concerned about hacktivists coming after you, you may well have somebody in your organization who's quite sympathetic. Um, and adversaries also differ in their level of support. There are adversaries who just trying to hack into whatever service they can find for fun on the weekend, and when they don't get in, they don't get in. And then there are others who have lots of support and who have even nation states behind them, helping them, providing their needs so they can work on things full time. And so a key keyword or a key phrase, sorry, that you should take away from this is the phrase threat model. So if you're going to actually think about security for yourself or your organization, you need some sort of a threat model. Now, it doesn't have to be very in-depth. So if we're doing big, complex things, then there are ways of formally modeling attackers, Dolov Yao attackers against security protocols, that kind of thing. Um, but whether it's for your business or just for yourself, in a lot of cases, an informal adversary model will do, and it'll get you thinking in the right direction. And so there are organizations that need to worry about somebody who accidentally breaks your security policy. If you, if you have rules around how your organization is supposed to work, and if those rules are really hard to follow, and we're going to see on the next slide, security is really about people. If you make your rules too hard to follow, somebody will not follow them, either deliberately or accidentally, and that could cause problems. Some people need to be worried about APTs, advanced persistent threats, nation state actors coming against them. Um, most individuals, however, do not. So don't sit at home worrying about, oh no, what if the Fancy Bear APT network is coming after me? They're probably not. On the other hand, if you have a business that stores a lot of personal information, then actors like that may well be coming after you. And so you need to think about things in a different way and build a different sort of team or acquire a different sort of outside expertise. Um, so there are lots of different informal models that people might need to think about. Um, certainly, most people may need to think about things like scammers. Just be not too trustful of things you read in emails or phone calls, that kind of thing. Um, and that's a realistic threat model for a lot of people. For a lot of organizations, more of the at informal adversary models that I've listed here will be relevant. So security is really about people. It's not just about technology. It's really fundamentally about people. It's the people that make it different from other kinds of fields. We care about the attacker's motivation, their capabilities, that kind of thing. But we also care about the people who are creating the systems, the kinds of mistakes that are very commonly made by programmers and hardware designers, etc. And we also have to think a lot about users and users' incentives. So I mentioned um, if you have rules that are hard for people to follow, they won't follow the rules, whether on purpose or accidentally. Um, and a classic example of this is the bad password policy. Organizations that are following outdated advice from like the 1980s that says you should make your employees change their password every six months and it should have at least this many character classes in it and stuff. Um, that, that's really bad outdated password advice, but for several reasons, one of which is it's kind of user hostile and it makes it hard for users to do the right thing. So you end up with users who create password one, password two, password three, and just increment the number over time and that kind of thing. Um, but it's not the user's fault, really. It is the fault of whoever wrote the policy that they're making it hard for their users or their employees to do the right thing. And so we need to think about users' incentives. So how do we respond to all of this adversarial thinking? There are threats out there, adversaries, um, there are different kinds of threat models, the programmers fail in certain ways, users fail in other ways. How do we think, or what should we do about this? Well, the first thing is to indeed think about threats. So don't have a false sense of optimism. If you want to be prepared for the worst, uh, or if, well, what's, what's the scout motto? It's something like uh, prepare for the worst and hope for the best. I don't know, no, be prepared, I guess. Anyway, um, I, I wasn't a scout on, well, I was a beaver a long time ago. It was, uh, I haven't been a scout since then, but, we shouldn't have a false sense of optimism assuming, oh, that'll never happen here. No, we should think about, could that happen here? Or better still, when that happens here, what will we do about it? Because being, uh, giving a little forethought 
to computer security can go a long way to being able to recover after the fact. So we need to think about adversaries. And obviously, if you're a business, then that means thinking about more adversaries than if you're an individual. But even an individual should have some realistic idea of who, I, who do I need to be worried about? I need to be worried about scammers. I might need to be worried about um, some really unfriendly person that I met one time or something. I don't need to be worried about the NSA. As if they wanted to get into your computer, they're going to anyway. Um, and we need to redefine some keywords like trust. So um, trust is a very positive word for many people. It makes you feel good, warm and fuzzy, et cetera. Um, but <laughs> let me change the definition of the word trust for you. So here's an example of what computer security people mean when we say trust. So imagine I'm gonna create a bank. It's called John Bank. It's super, it's a really, really good bank. You should definitely trust us with your money because I've got this vault. I'm gonna take all your money. I'm gonna put it in the vault and outside the vault, I'm gonna put Thomas. Now, we're not going to have deposit insurance. We're not going to have double entry bookkeeping. We're not going to have time locks on the vault. We're not going to have multiple tailors keeping an eye on it. No, we don't, we don't need any of that stuff. We have Thomas. Thomas is great. Now, do you want to put money in my bank? So even if Thomas is, in fact, a very sensible person, and maybe even if Thomas is very trustworthy and we go way back, um, if Thomas is the only thing standing between all of that money and bank robbers, I'm actually putting Thomas in danger, right? That, that's not a very responsible way for me to behave with your money or, in fact, with Thomas. So instead, wouldn't it be better if my bank had Thomas and security cameras and time locks and insurance and double entry bookkeeping and a policy about how much cash could be kept on hand at any given time and 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 so trust is something that we actually want to reduce we want to put fewer eggs in more baskets so the word trust is often a very positive warm and friendly warm and fuzzy word like i said but an alternate definition and this is especially relevant in a business context is that a trusted system is one that can get you fired so a trusted system is one where you say we're going to use this we can't do anything to verify that it's correct that it works well um but i guess i'm the one who vouched for it so my career's on the line if it doesn't behave correctly that's a different way to think about trust so we actually want to reduce trust as much as possible by using less trusted components. And so sometimes you'll hear about like zero trust, which is a bit of a buzzword, um, but it, there's, a, there's a truth that it's trying to get at there. Um, but what we want to do is use systems in which we don't have to put all of our trust in um, in any one particular system. So we can do things like support software and software companies that use sandboxing. If you download an application from an app store, whether that's like a Mac or an iOS app store, or whether it's an, the Google Play Store on your Android phone, or uh, I, to a lesser extent, I think the Microsoft Store on Windows computers, um, there's actually a certain amount of what we call sandboxing built in, which allows software to run in, and here's a picture of you know, a cute little kid in a sandbox, um, where the software runs in an environment where if it causes epic damage, it knocks over sandcastles and things, there's no long-term damage, it's all temporary. Um, and actually software runs like that today. If you, run, if you download something through an app store, then you can run it with a lot more confidence than if you go to some dodgy website that says download this software and click the thing that says disable system integrity protection and then you can run my software. Well, that should put up some red flags. So um, supporting using environments that use this kind of technology sends a signal that says we want more of this, please. Compartmentalization, and that is again in a software context, like if you use a modern web browser, each tab is actually kept separate from each other so that they can't interfere with each other and so that this tab playing a video can't access my online banking tab. But it's also in a sense of, we can have compartmentalization in the sense of um, there are accounts that I use for my work things and there are accounts that I use for my personal things. And you know we can have um, uh, systems and accounts and physical devices and things that are used for different purposes and keeping the kind of information that we would like in this sphere away from the places that are related to this sphere can be a very helpful thing. Um, if someone breaks into the password vault that stores some of my work passwords, that would be a problem, but I don't want them to also have access to my personal passwords. 
and vice versa. Um, authentication is something that ordinary users can do. And I mentioned password management already. Um, so having a password manager is a fantastic idea. Enabling multi-factor authentication in your most important places like your email account and things like that. It's really, um, those are really useful things that ordinary users can do. And um, companies can support users in allowing them to, for example, have privacy and security by default. Don't build products in which I have to go through 47 tick boxes to have privacy options. No, if we build things that have security and privacy properties built in from the get-go, uh, we'll support users, but also give ourselves an easier, an easier time down the road because we won't get in trouble for losing information that we never collected, for example. Avoiding onerous policies, like I said, the, the classic bad password policy, avoid that kind of thing. Um, but also, fundamentally, whether you have users, employees, or whoever else you are either building things for or using systems to advance their interests, think of security as a foundation, not a decoration. It doesn't have to be visible. And it doesn't have to be something that people see all the time, and it should never be for show. Security should, and privacy should be something that we build in as a foundation for everything else that we do. So um, that is some, in, well, I hope that's some interesting things to know about cybersecurity or computer security. Why does it matter? Well, because we're dependent on computing systems. Is that a bad thing? Not necessarily, as long as we understand what that means. What is computer security and how is it different from other kinds of risk in uh, management activities? Well, it has to do with the adversary. And so what we can, what can we do? We can think about adversaries, we can think about threats, and then we can work to mitigate them. So if anyone has any questions, I, I'd love to be able to answer them. Um, I'm normally very interactive in lectures and things, so this is weird for me waiting to the end to answer questions. Uh, but Janet, I believe that you're going to uh, read out any questions that have been asked. Is that right? That is correct. That is correct. Thank you so much, Dr. Anderson, for that. That is such insight into what so, for so many of us is such a complicated issue uh, and subject. Uh, I'd like to quickly thank our sponsor for today, Johnson Insurance, uh, offers Memorial University alumni specially designed policies and preferred rates on home and car insurance. So you've got a number there that you can call for additional information. Um, I am quickly gonna pop up our question slide, even though everyone knows we are going to questions now. And first question uh, from Jane uh, to uh, Jonathan. Many of us rely on password managers such as I, such as one password. While seemingly secure and convenient, there is a risk that if one password databases are compromised, we lose everything. What are your thoughts on this? Is there a better way to create and store passwords? Yeah, so password managers are a really, really important part of what ordinary people can do every single day to protect themselves because as we said we want to as we said as i said we want to spread out uh the risk and not trust any one thing too much well that applies to passwords too if you have one password that you use everywhere then that means that when home depot has a data breach there's a risk that they might be putting your online banking at risk so we don't want that kind of thing and password managers allow us to generate a bunch of passwords use a different one for every site um so Certainly, it also means that password managers are key targets, and so it is important to make sure that they're built with certain principles. Uh, one principle, and you know, to the best of my knowledge, one password, last pass, definitely iCloud Keychain, other password managers that are available, um, they should be built in such a way that the people operating the service cannot see your password. So I have a login for one password. I have information that I share with one password that lets them find my account. But then there's also an additional passphrase that is used to encrypt stuff so that even the people at one password, even if they went full rogue and decided to sell my passwords on the internet, wouldn't actually be able to. So there is a tension there because there's a certain amount of trust that you have to put in these companies that to ensure that they're doing the thing they said they're doing. Um, however, done correctly, it is possible for password management to be done quite safely and definitely encourage people to use a service like that. Great. Uh, we did have a couple of questions about passwords. Uh, so I hope that answers 
that for everyone. Here's a question. Are we ready for the future technology like the quantum computers? What if the current encryption algorithms will be broken by quantum computers? How do we think or how do we prepare for that situation? Yeah, so um, I mean, quantum computers will change a lot of things, but not everything. Um, so quantum computation is known to be able to make certain mathematical problems much, much, much easier to solve. Um, so factoring large numbers, for example, which you might say, well, who cares about factoring large, almost prime numbers? Well, the answer is that's a foundation for some of our encryption um, algorithms that exist. Um, however, People are already studying and, in fact, standardizing quantum resistant algorithms. So there are some things that will be made much faster because of the kind of parallelism, et cetera, that's inherent in quantum computing. Um, but there's no reason to believe that once quantum computing becomes practical and mainstream, that doesn't mean that all of our cryptography is going to be thrown out the window. It means that certain algorithms we'll have to st stop using and we'll have to use some other ones instead, but we've already started to use them. And there are certain whole categories of cryptographic algorithms that will be just completely not affected. The, um, the symmetric key cryptography, that's the foundation for a lot of stuff in your bank card, for example, that, that that's going to be no problem whatsoever. Okay. Um, do you have any recommendations for resources or discounts for small nonprofits trying to balance computer security with funding and programming? Yeah, um, I mean, so I don't have like specific advice about funding and things, although um, there are there are organizations around that can help with um, salary support for, for example, hiring graduate students or co-op students. And, you know, I, I know some of those folks, so you got to get that little plug in there. Um, there. There is expertise around that can be accessed for varying degrees of money. So if you're a small company, if you're a nonprofit or something, um, there are ways to get some insight, um, you know, maybe not a consultant with a list of certifications as long as their arm, but perhaps somebody who has um, enough background and enough expertise to get you started on asking the right questions and thinking about the right things. Um, and whether that is uh, graduate students or other kind of people, I mean, if you're local, I might even be able to help you connect with some of that kind of expertise. That's great. Thank you. Um, you talked about personal versus enterprise security. Are there any trends these days in terms of attacks? Are, are you more likely to be hacked through an enterprise source versus an individual, for example? Um, so I think It depends on the kind of, of attack that you're thinking about. Um, so if you mean hacked in the sense of somebody gaining access to your personal information, um, I think most people are probably more likely to see their information dumped because somebody broke into a large retailer or something like that. Um, I think you're more likely to see that than to see somebody targeting your computer specifically and trying to like break into it for your personal information. Um, certainly there are a lot of broad brush, like just try to fool anybody who will download this thing to download it to their computer so that we can break into it. But in that case, um, often it is less about like trying to get your personal information specifically and more about trying to, for example, just run ransomware on absolutely as many computers as they can find. Um, or in some cases, run software in the background that will do crypto mining so they can get like bitcoins and stuff. Um, yeah, I'm not sure if I fully understand the question, but I hope I hope that gets at it a little bit at least. Um, and uh, I'm just going back to whoever asked that question, if he wanted to pop something a little bit, um, if he had any more detail explicitly about what he was asking, maybe we could uh, get to that as well. Um, here's a question from Greg. He worked at, he works as an IT director in the field for 20 years, mostly operations and help desk, and he is now heavily involved with security. What IT certifications would you suggest someone like himself start with? Yeah, so that's that's a good question, and I don't have a specific answer. Um, I mean, the number of organizations and certifications that exist to help attest to a certain amount of background knowledge is growing <laughs> by a lot. Um, so it's a real alphabet soup out there of different certifications that you can get. Um, 
Yeah. So, it, I mean, if you're looking for that for kind of career wise, there are perhaps some sources that I might be able to connect you with who would have better information. Um, but if you're thinking about kind of protecting your personal information and stuff, I would say that the, the certification is less important than kind of some of the initial probing questions that you can do uh, or that you can ask yourself. Um, yeah. And if, I don't know, if there's a more specific question, it might be like a connect offline kind of thing. Great. Um, uh, is it safer to bank using their the bank's app or their website, or does it make any difference? Um, so the app on a non-jailbroken phone is always going to be a little bit safer. Um, depending on your exact computing situation, I mean, for a lot of people, there there may not be much of a difference. Um, but for some people, there'll be quite a bit of difference and it depends on the details of exactly how your computer is set up and what options you've enabled and what operating system you're using and stuff. Um, but in general, I would say that the sandboxing features, et cetera, that exist on both Android and iOS are much, much stronger than at least some desktop <laughs> environments. You see some of the same features that exist on iOS also being on like a Mac, but for example, um, you know, on most desktop computers, people rightfully want to say, I own this computer. I want to be able to install whatever software I want. Um, and on a phone, we kind of accept that maybe we don't get to do that so much. Um, and so that means that people actually tolerate a lot stronger security features on the phone. Um, and you are much less likely to have malware running on your phone. And therefore, I mean, I, I do both, right? I, I do online banking on the browser on my computer, and I also do it on the my app on my phone. Um, but if I had like a small business where I were authorizing pay Payroll and it was in my contract that I only had 48 hours to report a fraudulent transaction or else the money is gone forever. I, I would probably not do that kind of thing from my computer. Mm -hmm. um, is Google itself a safe password manager? Um, so it depends what you mean exactly. So Google Chrome, for example, will do password syncing and it gives you the option to use an additional passphrase. So, like I said, um, something that makes sure that even Google can't see your passwords. I think, you know, and I have used that and I think I might still <laughs> a little bit. Um, and, and that's a very sensible thing to do. If I were doing any kind of password syncing, I'd want to make sure it's on something that provides um, kind of independent encryption such that even the provider can't see, because no one else needs to see my passwords except for me. Um, you know, I will say that some of these large firms will have different levels of commitment to security and privacy than others. And I know some of the folks in like Google security who are very, very good <laughs> and very passionate about protecting user data that's at rest. Um, and of course, some of these large tech firms, like we don't always want to trust big tech firms, um, but there's a couple of different ways that we can trust companies. We can trust them to be competent or we can trust them to have our best interest at heart. And um, although a small company might have your best interest at heart, they probably don't have a security team with dozens of people with PhDs who are capable of standing up against an advanced persistent threat, for example, whereas people like Google have had to protect the personal details of democracy advocates in Hong Kong and that kind of thing against very motivated adversaries. So, yeah, there's a trade off there. Mm -hmm. uh, we've got time for a couple more questions. Uh, here's a general 1. how effective are VPNs? So, I mean, VPNs can be helpful depending again, what your kind of threat model is, what it is that you are worried about. Um, if you're worried about somebody who is on the same Wi-Fi in a coffee shop being able to read your online banking details? Well, that doesn't matter because they can't anyway, whether you're using a VPN or not, um, because of the, the, so if you see the little lock icon and HTTPS next to a website, that means that whoever's in between can't read what you're seeing anyway, even if it, even if you're the company that runs the Wi-Fi for second cup or whoever. Um, if on the other hand, what you're concerned about is the company that your coffee shop has contracted to collecting information about, oh, I saw that computer here and then here and then here and then here. So I know their shopping patterns and I'm going to monetize that if you're concerned about that. Well, VPNs can help with that kind of thing. 
um, with the likely Russian attack on Ukraine and the Russian attack on Western IT systems and critical infrastructure, what practical action should home computer users take? Yeah, so I would say that um, kind of home computer users should do the things that I was talking about in terms of thinking about adversaries and, and being cautious and careful. And, um, you know, when somebody claims something that sounds too good to be true, to, don't believe them, that kind of thing. Be, be a little careful and selective about software you choose to download and run if it's in an environment where, like, if it's just a regular Windows box where you can run anything and anything can do anything, um, then, yeah, I'd be, I'd be careful, almost anything, uh, I'd be, those are the kind of normal precautions that everyone should take. I would say that um, what that has to do with kind of geopolitical events happening in Ukraine is, is yeah. actually not very much. Um, again, I think it's the sort of thing where if for whatever reason the FSB were interested in you specifically, then there's probably not much that you can do about it. Um, so what you can do is defend yourself against attackers who are a bit more plausible for you specifically. Um, and yeah. Okay. And the last question, uh, can you comment on inherent risks when linking, syncing and mirroring hardware, software, apps, et cetera? Um, this, um, uh, person says, I am old school and find this user capability weakens the security of the individual, individual parts. If a hacker can find one way in, can they see everything? It seems hackers have apps available. Anyway, how best to stop them? I guess, well, you can answer that. Yeah. Um, so I'm not sure that I fully understand the question, to be honest, but I think um, there's a certain amount. I mean, if you're talking about syncing information between, for example, your laptop and your phone or something like that, um, yeah, I, I think I'm not personally too concerned about that. So it's true that if someone managed to break into my phone, then they could also see the contact information of people who are contacts that I've saved on my desktop. But on the other hand, they're more likely to have just broken into the desktop anyway. The phone is a much harder target. Um, so I don't think it adds that much additional risk. Um, I guess the other way could be true, but on the other hand, um, the information that is on either my phone or my computer is not something that can really be easily monetized. So it's not something that I'm terribly concerned about. Okay. Um, it's time to wrap up. I, 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 this is, this hour has gone by so quickly and, um, I would like to thank Dr. Anderson sincerely for sharing his time and expertise with us. Uh, Dr. Anderson, do you have any final words for our audience? Uh, no, just thanks very much. And I guess my email address was on the final slide, but I could also drop it in the chat if that's helpful. Great. And we'll, um, we'll include your email address in the follow up email that were sent to all the registrants. So if they had any specific questions, they can follow up with you. Okay. Great. So, um, thank you so much for everyone out there for attending and for your great questions. If you enjoyed today's event, please check out our alumni website for upcoming events. Uh, including um, an event, a Mun Alum 101 event on living with dementia and also on fake news. As I indicated earlier, this session has been recorded and we will be sharing a link in an upcoming email. So please keep your eyes on your inbox. I hope everyone enjoys the rest of their day. Thank you again, Dr. Anderson. And um, that's it for us. Thank you. Thank you.